Everyone knows that Babylon the Great is a major player in the prophecies of the last days. But if you got down your Bible atlas and go looking for Babylon, what you're going to find is a set of ruins, a museum and a hotel somewhere in Iraq, and certainly nothing that is a world power or that amounts to anything in the world. Babylon is gone. Now there was a geographical area referred to as Babylon, the same area generally in the days of Jesus. There were still Jews there, in fact, living prosperously in Babylon all the way through the first century. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud originated from the Jewish colony that was in Babylon. But as far as Babylon, as the Bible talked about the old city of Babylon, the old city of Babylon was total ruin. Now, Babylon, in the days when John, the ba John uh, who uh, wrote the book of Revelation, was on the Isle of Patmos, even then, was absolutely nothing but ruins. But in spite of that, John saw a vision about Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, at the, at the end time, on the island of Patmos, late in the first century. And it was an important vision, and one, one has to ask yourself, what on earth did John and the people who initially read that book and that prophecy that he wrote down, that vision that he described, what in the world did they think that John was talking about? Now, there's one striking difference between the Babylon of Revelation and the Babylon of the Old Testament. John's vision in places is a nightmare quality. He's in vision. He's gone from anybody who was around him would never know what is going on with John. He probably was in a trance. In this vision, time meant nothing. Images were everything. And yet, all of us understand, I think every commentator who's ever picked up the book of Revelation understands, that it is inescapably looking forward to a time which we have not yet encountered. Revelation 17, verse 1, he comes to a point in his vision where he says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me. Now, I think most commentators will divide Revelation up and organize it much like we do, that you have a vision involving seven seals, which are open sequentially. The seventh seal opens up seven trumpets, which blow and are sounded sequentially. And when the seventh trumpet is sounded, Seven vials or bowls of God's wrath are poured out upon the earth. It's a wretched time, uh, terrible to behold or to consider, leading up to this moment in time. But then the, one of the angels that had those bowls came and said to me, Show, come with me, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute that sits upon many waters. Good old King James call, Version calls her the great whore that sits upon many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery. The inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, covered with blasphemous names, seven heads, and ten horns. Talk about nightmare. This thing is, is wild beyond anything we could imagine. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and you should understand that this is not merely a matter of the colors, the matter of the expense, because purple and scarlet dyes were staggeringly expensive in the ancient world. Most people wore stuff that was the color it came out of the, out of the sheep with some dirt added to it. These people were wearing scarlet, you know, linen, with it had been dyed into beautiful colors with their expensive dyes. She says, she is not only dressed in purple and scarlet, she is glittering with gold and precious stones, and pearls. She had a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. I can't even imagine, you know, what, what he's trying to tell us here. It's all symbolic, of course, but nevertheless, the image that he is drawing is one that is absolutely vile. The title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Prostitutes and of the Abominations of the Earth. Must have been a rather large forehead. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now, this is a woman, notice this, she was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Then are we talking about old Babylon? Can't be. We cannot possibly be talking about the Babylon that was over in Mesopotamia. Everything that she did was done. The prophets had talked about her. Her role in world affairs was over 
long before this time ever came about, now we are talking about one who has been a major persecutor of the saints of God. Okay? When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. And the angel said to me, what are you surprised or astonished with? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come out of the abyss and will go to destruction. Now, that leaves an awful lot of stuff open for interpretation, and commentators and, and would-be prophets have played with this for generations to try to explain what it means and what it goes. For you and I, I think it's enough to think, here's John on the Isle of Patmos, and he says to him, it once was, now is not, will come out of nowhere, out of the abyss in a sense, and will go into destruction. Whatever that means, keep it in mind. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, and now is not, and will come. Everybody, he implies, thought they were through with this thing. It is not, he says, but it is going to come. Now, whether the is not meant in John's day, or whether it meant in the time when the visions began to be fulfilled, we'll have to leave that question on the shelf for answer another time or circumstance. Now, did you notice the striking difference between the Babylon of Revelation 17 and the Babylon of the Old Testament? The Babylon, the Babylon, Babylon the Great in Revelation is a woman. Babylon in the Old Testament, the king of Babylon is referred to, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon in type referred to as the devil, Never in the Old Testament's Babylon, I, I refer to it as she because we in conventional English refer to cities or nations as she, but the, the Old Testament really doesn't use the feminine Im imagery for old Babylon in a way, not in the way Revelation does. This Babylon is a woman. Now I want us to go back today and to study the Old Testament prophecy of Babylon, but I want us to go back and look at one that is very rarely referenced. I doubt if you can even spell for, with, with any certainty the name of the prophet. His name is Habakkuk. When I brought him up in a radio program recently, my, my engineer, who does read the Bible, had never heard of Habakkuk before and did not know the book was in the Bible. So it's not one of those prophecies that people cite a great deal. And yet, it is a stark, striking prophecy about Babylon, and it has some implications I think are worth looking at. Habakkuk is sort of an oratorio or a cantata in three chapters. Now, I say that because at the end of it, he says, for the director of music on my stringed instruments. In other words, he, and this is often the case with prophets, prophets they write these things in poetic form, in he, what is Hebrew poetic form, and sometimes it's difficult for the English reader to grasp exactly what, what he's doing with them. But they are like oratorios, like cantatas, like musical presentations that are made with stringed instruments and with a singer standing before you, chanting probably more in this time than what we would call it today, the message of the prophet. So it's a musical work. I would suppose that Habakkuk is written early among the minor prophets because he writes before the fall of Babylon. Now, <coughs> I say this, but whenever the Holy Spirit comes upon a prophet and a prophet speaks, it's not always safe to conclude that you know when he was writing. Because indeed it's possible Babylon had fallen and he was looking forward to a future fall of Babylon sometime in the future yet that we hadn't even thought about or he hadn't thought about. I don't know. But generally speaking, most, most commentators will place Habakkuk because of his content prior to the actual fall and destruction of Babylon, which will, reason for that will become apparent soon. The Medes have not yet come down upon Babylon. Habakkuk 1 verse 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. Now it begins with a prayer of Habakkuk, which is more or less a complaint, a lament, a common lament, it seems, among the prophets from time to time. He says, how long, Lord, do I have to call for help and you won't listen? Or cry out to you, violence, violence, and you don't save. You know, he, he said, he's saying, my simple cry, violence, without any verb, subject, or anything else, is, is sufficient. That He says, why is it you don't save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why have you stuck me here where I have to, every time I look at any kind, every time I hear the news, every time I go to the city gate, I have to face injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? 
Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Now, perhaps this is so common in the human condition that it's unremarkable because it certainly is a description of our society right now. It fits us as well as anything that he, they could have been true there. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are in front of me. And folks, we have it in front of us like no generation never known to man because of the media who are able to keep our nose stuck in it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, there is a consequence, though, for this condition. He says, you make me see this, destruction, violence, all this. And then he says, therefore, the law is paralyzed. This is the NIV, and they use this, and I think it is a striking statement, and an accurate translation in this case, better than the King James. The law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. I was talking to my friends at the radio studio after the Supreme Court decision legalizing sodomy, and they were lamenting how that over the previous weekend, they had been unable to see much of anything on television in terms of news that wasn't, or, or anything that wasn't preoccupied with the gay agenda. It was homosexuality this, homosexuals that. We're going to have homosexual marriage, uh, sod the right to sodomy that the Supreme Court has established for us. Now, they were complaining that over the weekend, they had absolutely felt beleaguered by the way in which this information kept coming at them. They actually felt hemmed in. And it was so striking to me because I had prepared to do a program that included Habakkuk, this first section of Habakkuk, that day at, when they were sitting there telling me how they felt over the preceding uh, weekend. And verse 4 is an apt description also of where we are today. The law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. You know, you would think that as a people, we could go to our elected representatives. Our elected re representatives could meet and make decisions about laws whereby you and I are going to live and that we would have some kind of justice. But they can make a law. It can go up to nine robe justices, which we call the Supreme Court, and they can throw that law right out the window. They can decide that, no, no, that doesn't work. That's not possible. And they can make law from the bench, something the founding fathers of this country never imagined. Now, why have we gotten, how have we gotten to this place? to where we have a, a judicial system that no longer looks to the law and the Constitution. They look to the history of the last 50 years to see what the people of this country seem to want. Rather than waiting to see what the people of this country say they want from their legislatures, they're judging by the mores, the, the, the general approach to life that we have. Not only that, sometimes they're actually beginning to look overseas on some of the decisions as to what world customs are like and whether or not the United States is in sync with the rest of the world for these things. The law is paralyzed. Justice doesn't prevail. Murderers can sit in prison year after year after year after year, fed, clothed, and housed by you and me and our tax money. When they, when they have killed somebody, everybody knows they have killed somebody, but the law is paralyzed and powerless to deal with them in any type of expeditious manner. It's one of the things that, you know, it's one thing to be absolutely sure a person's law, rights are protected. It's another thing to preserve a killer alive when everybody knows he's guilty. I mean, that's just one of the things that we do these days. Well, he had his say, Habakkuk did, very much concerned about his world. And God now has his turn to speak. He says, verse 5, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize the dwelling places that are not their own, you know, to gab other people's property. The King James Version calls them a bitter and hasty nation. Very apt description. If you want to know what this looks like, just think about the Germans and Blitzkrieg. If you want to know what a bitter and hasty nation doing what they say that the Babylon did here, if you want to get an image in your mind of what that was like, you just take a look at the Nazis and Blitzkrieg. Verse 7, they are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and they promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at, du at dusk. 
Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. They come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, and they gather up prisoners like sand, like the desert wind would do. The image would fit the German invasion of Poland and then France, which, which forced the British into an incredible panic in their evacuation of Dunkirk because the Germans were so feared, so fast, so strong, so much like vultures coming to devour, which brings the image of the Stuka dive bomber into vision. When you look at all this type of thing, you can understand why the British were anxious to get off at Dunkirk. These people deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at fortified cities. They just build some earthen ramps and capture them. They go over the top of the wall. They sweep past like the wind and go right on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. The thing they worship is the power of their own hand. They worship their armaments. They worship their tanks. They worship their airplanes. They worship in those days it was their horses, their chariots. They were so proud of and made their, their God their, their instruments of warfare into their God. Now it's Habakkuk's turn to speak to God. And you find a lot of this, by the way, in the prophets. You have to be alert as you're reading along, lest you lose track of, of who's talking to who in the prophets. Habakkuk, Habakkuk speaks to God. God speaks to him. Habakkuk speaks back. He said, O Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die, O Lord. You have appointed them to execute judgment. I know they're coming. I know we're going to deal with the Babylonians, he said. I know that you have appointed them to execute judgment upon us as a people because of what we've done. O rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. That's, he says, he, I understand, God. I understand that you cannot tolerate the level of wrong and violence that we have in this land. So I know you're going to do something. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? And then he brings a rather fascinating uh, analogy into this. He says, you have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. You know, every fish is on his own. They, they're, it's every, every fish for himself, as it were. They have no ruler. They have no organized structure. You can kind of get that impression in schools of fish sometime, but there still is really no organization there. They have no ruler. The wicked foal pulls them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them in a dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he, is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Is this going to go on indefinitely, God? He's going to keep on, he's going to sweep his net in here and dump a bunch of the poor fish on the table and devour them. He's going to keep on with another one and go right on. Is, he, is this just going to go on and on? Men are like sea creatures that have no ruler. That's what he's saying. Every man for himself, like sheep without a shepherd. But the Chaldeans have a ruler. And they're gathering up everybody that doesn't have one. Habakkuk 2. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. He says, I'm going to go up on a wall, get up there by myself where I can look out over the landscape, and I want to see if God has something to say to me. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation. Write it down. Make it plain on tablets so the herald can run with it. I don't want this just for these people here. I want you to get it written down. I want the word spread wherever it goes. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, for it will certainly come and will not delay. The Hebrew word for end means just that. The end of what? Well, it doesn't say. But it means literally the extremity. Is it right out on the bitter end of whatever it is you're talking about? It doesn't necessarily mean the last days or the end of man or the end of this age or anything of the sort. But it does mean the end. The revelation awaits for an appointed time. It speaks of the end and it will never prove false. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not right, but the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is greedy as the grave, 
And like death is never satisfied. What an imagery. Greedy is the grave. In other words, you can never end, never put a stop to the putting of bodies in graveyards. It just goes on and on and on. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives of all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and, sto- and scorn, saying, Woe to him that sp- piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? They're talking about Babylon, Chaldeans. How long, the people are saying, must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed men's blood. (coughs) You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. The image of the complete and utter destruction of cities and peoples and, and areas by Babylon is legendary. And this, of course, is the cry of those peoples to God who will do say something about it. He says, Woe to him that builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out. The beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. <clears throat> this is the call that comes from the walls, the timbers, and everything else. Woe to him that does this kind of thing. And this, of course, is what Babylon did and did and did and did. Has the Lord Almighty determined that people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It comes out of the middle of nowhere, this little verse. And we find it elsewhere in the Bible, and we basically know what it's talking about, is there is a time in the future when the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that cover the sea. You won't say to every man to his neighbor, know the Lord, or do you know the Lord? For everyone will know the Lord from the least to the greatest. So right out of the middle of nowhere, Habakkuk says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so he can gaze on their naked bodies. Woe to him to get somebody else drunk so he can take advantage of him. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Now you drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. Now, just a minute. Do you hear echoes of revelation coming back to you from here? We were just reading about this great harlot riding on the beast with a cup in her hand full of abominations and filth of the earth. It talks about the wine of her fornication. Here he talks about drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. Your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed men's blood and have destroyed lands and cities and everybody in them. What's an idol worth since a man has carved it? I mean, a man carved it. What's the big deal about your idols? He said he makes, he who makes it trusts in his own creation. You made it. What makes you think it's any importance? He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him that says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? You've covered it up with silver and gold. There's no breath in it. It can't talk to you. It can't give you a right way to go. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. These little interjections. The whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now another interjection. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Both of these little two little things here really reach down toward the end time in, their, in, in the imagery or the, the ideas that they are bringing forward to us. Now comes Habakkuk chapter 3. It's a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. And it is, if you're musically inclined, a recitative. O Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. I know you're angry. I know you're furious. You have every reason to be. All I ask is that in your wrath, remember mercy. God came from the east, is what that means. His glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. 
plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled. The age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. What's he talking about? We're talking about something rather significant, I would think. Plague and pestilence. Nations trembling. The ancient mountains crumbling. What's going on here? Well, there were two particular passages that came to mind for me when I read this. One of them, you'll come keep your place here. We'll come back to Habakkuk in a moment. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. We're now talking about the seventh angel in Revelation of the angels that are going to pour out God's wrath upon the people. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It's done. Then came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. It's was so, so tremendous the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed, and God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the fury of his wrath. Aha! Now we've got a strong connection between Habakkuk and Revelation, even stronger than we had before. The wine cup that was going to be given to Babylon is there, and of course here we find once again the great earthquake that comes along with it and the cup being given to her. The other scripture was Haggai chapter 2, verse, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord. Man, it's a, it, I, I have sung this particular item out of Handel's Messiah in, rest, in uh, uh, recital once. It's a really difficult one to sing. It's yet once a little while, and I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, the dry land. Everything will be shaken. And, of course, one of the... the uh, Apostles made the statement that it signifies that the shaking of everything, that only that which cannot be shaken will remain. So again, we have Habakkuk, Revelation, Habakkuk, Revelation, and this whole thing about the very end time, whereas Habakkuk could not possibly have been looking that far into the future. Uh, he could not possibly himself have imagined it. And yet here it is, being presented to us once again by, by John in his revelation, whereas Habakkuk presented it to us all those generations before. He said, I saw the tents of Cushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. These were places a long way off. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Were you mad against the water? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you raise against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the light flashing of your light of your spear. You know, this is this is what this is telling us is a time of the presence of God when everything comes unstuck. It's basically what he's telling us. The mountains are falling down. The mountains are collapsing. They're writhing, as it were. The seas are roaring. Rivers are stopping in their tracks. The whole thing is coming apart. In wrath, you strode through the earth, and in anger, you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head, while his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating about it to devour the wretches who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded, and my lips quivered at the sound. You just imagine how it hit Habakkuk. Decay crept into my bones. My legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. It's as though he stood on the walls and looked out, and here comes Babylon. He says, I know what the end of Babylon is going to be because I know what God has told me. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, which was the condition probably when he was on the wall, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my, my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to go on the heights. 
You know, Habakkuk is really one of the finest of the Old Testament prophets, but he's not much read and not much understood. And having read this, I want to take you back to Revelation now and the Babylon that we found there, because this is a Babylon that I think we yet have to deal with. Revelation 17, verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman, Babylon the Great, sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, another is still to come. And when he does come, he'll have to hang around for a while. The beast, which once was, now is not, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Now, I'll tell you, that reads like a riddle if I ever read one. And one very difficult to, to resolve. The ten horns are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but for one hour will receive authority as kings with the beast. They have one purpose, will give their power and their authority to the beast. Now, if I were there, if I were somewhere where they brought John's letter within a matter of a week or two after John had written it, the vision had been finished, they came to my church, they read this letter to me, I would be absolutely persuaded that Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, was none other than the city of Rome. Been almost inescapable. It's oddly, it may surprise you, but Roman Catholics believe that Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, was the city of Rome, imperial Rome. Not the Roman Catholic Church, imperial Rome. They see it there them themselves. And so it is that we have the city sitting on seven hills, and at that time, in the world at that time, Rome was the dominant city. There was nothing like Rome. There was no city like her. She was the center of all commerce. She was the center of military power. Her soldiers had created a Roman peace, the Pax Romana, they call it, around the world. She was the world's city at the time. So I don't think I could have found a way not to see Rome in these prophecies had I got this letter while John was still living. They will make war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, and languages. She dominates everything in sight. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. Now, what that turns out to mean in the end, we'll have to wait and see. But they will hate her. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are finished. God says, I'm going to put it in their hearts. I'm going to bring it to pass. Ten nations will give their power to the beast for a very short period of time to do what I want done. Just like Babylon received her power in Old Testament times for a short period of time and so that they could do what God wanted done. And in the end... Well, the end was very bitter for Babylon, as it is indeed for this terrible city. The woman, he says, you saw, is that great city which rules over the kings of the earth. Yeah, if you're John, what do you think? Rome. There's nowhere else to go. Now, I think what we're looking here is what people loosely call the duality of prophecy. It is definitely type and anti-type, an Old Testament type, a New Testament anti-type, a, a, a secondary fulfillment of an old prophecy. It is, if you want to like music, it is theme with variations. It is the same old theme and brought back to us again, but this time with certain variations introduced into it. The question is, what does all this mean to you? It's interesting to know. It's uh, maybe casts a little bit of light on some of the prophecies we've looked at, gives us a little framework in which perhaps to understand them as they come to pass. But what does it mean to you? Let's continue briefly into Revelation 18 and see if we can see what it means. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. The earth was lit up by his glory. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons, a haunt of every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Now, I will tell you that this reference of becoming a home for demons is fascinating. I've heard other people talk about this as though the old city of Babylon that is down there in ruins like that, that city is a haunt for demons and every unclean and foul spirit. I take it a little differently. I think what we're seeing is that Babylon, the idea of Babylon, the Babylon in some one sense is a spiritual thing. 
and is an inhabit, inhabitant of demons, a cage for every foul and hateful bird, and that this spirit of Babylon exists down through time inhabited by these demons. All the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. Merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. And then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so you cannot share in her sins, so you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Now, I think it's all but impossible to define who or what this great city is at the time, the very time of the end. She's a persecuting power, one that persecutes the saints. When they finally open her up, she's filled with the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all who have been killed on the earth. It's all been impossible to determine who the city will be at the end time, but it is clear that she will be there. If I had been living when this vision was handed down, I would have had no doubts at all. Babylon the Great, the mother of kingdoms, would have been none other than Rome. The call to come out of her, my people, that you will not share in her sins, that you will not receive any of her plagues. To me, living in the first century, would have been a call to get out of Dodge, to pick up my family, get out of Rome. I couldn't have taken it any other way but to get away from that, that, that city. Oddly enough, though, nothing much happened to Rome for a long time after this. Rome eventually fell. Oh, there was a fire in Rome not long, long after this, but the fact is not a great deal of things happened to Rome for a very long time. So the call, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and suffer when the city comes down, wouldn't have really said very much to people at the time that was useful. I think perhaps there is uh, the, the call to come out of Babylon you have, you'd almost have to answer, if you're like, like Habakkuk on the wall, or you heard this call saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not a partaker of her sins, you'd almost have to come back to God and say, Lord, where are we going to go? Because Babylon is everywhere. It's everywhere. And you think, you know, I get, you know we, we get a little frustrated with our own country sometimes and our own Congress and judicial system and the violence in our cities. You think, well, I'll, we'll immigrate. We'll go to Australia. Babylon is there. Babylon is there. You want to immigrate and go to New Zealand? Babylon is there. You want to go to Italy? Babylon is there. You want to go to Israel? Babylon is there. Wherever you want to go in the world, it seems not. Now, this, this, this spirit of this foul woman is present, it seems, everywhere. And the strange thing is, even Jerusalem in one way was a type of Babylon at one time. She's called Sodom on one occasion, but one of the links from Revelation 18 4, where it says, Come out of her, my people, took me to Matthew 24, verse 15, where it says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoever reads it, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Let not him that is in the field come back to take his clothes. You know, in a sense, where you have to flee from depends on where you are. Think about that. Where you are going to flee from depends on, naturally, where you are. And when I looked at this and I thought about it, I think like Israel of old, we have to be led forth out of Babylon. You know, Israel could not, in the, in the, in the days of Babylon and her heights of her power, they could not just pack up their goods and go back home to, to, to Judah. It's not, it wasn't possible. They were captives where they were. They actually had to be led out of Babylonian captivity. God had to open the door, had to give a vision, had to actually change kings' hearts in order to make it possible for Israel to actually return to the land. And I had to think about that, and I thought maybe, maybe like Israel of old, we have to be led forth out of Babylon. And who might our leader be? And that took me back to Isaiah chapter 52, when an oddly related scripture. In verse 7, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publishes salvation. It says to Zion, your God reigns. When's this? That God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring Zion back. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. 
The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go out of the midst of her, be you clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. What's this talking about? Well, again, you have the get out of Babylon thing that's here. Depart, depart, be clean all you that bear the vessels, vessels of the Lord. But you will not go out with haste, nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your reward. Basically, what he's saying to us is, when you leave Babylon, I'm going to open the door. But then depart ye, depart ye, get out of here, you that bear the vessels of the Lord. What's that mean? He says, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonied at you, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations and the king shall shut their mouth at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, that which they had never heard they're going to think about. This is the Messiah. These are initial Messiah scriptures. And so I think about this, I look back and I say, here I am living in a Babylon, as it were, and with nowhere to go, because if I go where, wherever I go to, Babylon is there. And yet I look back and I says, depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go out of the midst of her. And then it says, be clean, you that bear the vessels of the Lord. I do believe that there is buried in all of this a call to us to separate ourselves, not from their neighbors, not from society as a whole, but to separate ourselves from certain things that, that, that tend to drag us down, that would make us unclean, that we who bear the vessels of the Lord are to be clean. And it is necessary for us from time to time to get away from things that will pull us down and that will defile us. Our obligation as people who bear the vessels of the Lord is to be clean and to be separate from the corruption of, the, of Babylon wherever our personal Babylon may be. It's a complicated lesson. It's buried deep in the prophets. And I can't tell you that I fully understand all the scriptures that I've read to you today, but I really believe that it's important for us to understand that when that scripture says, come out of her, my people, that you be not a partaker with her of her sins, that needs to speak to every one of us in our own personal Babylon so that we will take whatever steps we need to take to be clean, those of us who bear the vessels of the Lord.